episode 215 of Board Game Blitz, a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes the crowd to stop cheering after Simone Biles competes on Vault. Board Game Blitz is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. This week, we are talking about modifying games for certain players. First, we discuss a couple games we've played recently, Adventure Party, the role-playing party game, and Newsboys. Then, we talk about whether imposing advantages or disadvantages in games can make them more fair or more fun. And now, here are your hosts, Ambi and Crystal. Recently, I got a review copy of Adventure Party, the role-playing party game, published by Smirk and Dagger Games. This is designed by David Smith and Travis Winstead. This is a party game that's kind of themed around role-playing games. It kind of has the feel of a role-playing game, but it's a board game, party game. <laughs> so, it's all of the things, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it plays three to eight players, 30 to 60 minutes. The way the game works is it's a cooperative party game, and you have characters that you pick, kind of like an RPG. You can fill in your own character sheets and like pick a name and pick stats that you have but they also have like suggested characters for you and a description of the character so you don't have to do that and then they also have little adventures that you go on so they have a card that explains something that's happening like oh there's a dragon and blah 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 dragon and <laughs> <laughs> And blah, a, blah, 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 <laughs> dragon, you know, yeah. everyday things, whatever. <laughs> it has a paragraph and it's like, okay, well, then what do you do? And so you're trying to defeat the dragon and that's your goal. So there's a bunch of those cards and you can play different lengths of adventure. You can have like three adventures that you're trying to do or just one. So the way you're doing it is it's kind of like instead of one person being a GM, kind of everyone is shared. <laughs> so everyone has a 20-sided die. And then when it's your turn to like go, you say, okay, I'm going to try to attack the dragon with blah, blah, blah you have an item and you're saying okay I'm doing this and so you describe what you're trying to do and then you roll your die in secret and get an outcome and then you're trying to explain what happened based on your die roll and so everyone else is trying to guess your die roll based on like the outcome so it's kind of like one of those like communication limit party games but the scoring was kind of weird so it's not everyone else trying to guess your die roll it's just the one person who's like to your right I think that person like introduces the story and then asks you what you're doing and then you kind of say what you're doing and then they have the final guess but I don't think there's like any discussion between the players everyone's guessing on their own and then like only theirs counts for getting points as a group but everyone else's counts for getting like glory points themselves which at the end whoever has the most glory points gets to like say the finale of the story and count up everyone's score kind of so that like, sounds like a prize I do not want to win like <laughs> yeah, someone yeah, else like, can count <laughs> like, so yeah like those special like points that, that didn't really add much to it and it felt weird because only one person per person telling the story like counted if they got close and if other people got close it didn't really matter they get their own like little personal points that don't really matter throughout the game and so there wasn't like discussion of oh they failed miserably and so I think it's this and like discussion back and forth it's just one person guessing and then saying okay you said this so this is what it's going to be i like those party games where you're trying to guess a lot of those word party games or trying to guess things with communication limits like wavelength or something what is fun for me is the discussion between the teammates saying like oh they did this so it's going to be like over here on the dial or like all that back and forth discussion when you're trying to guess what the number is and this game did not have that So I felt like the scoring was kind of weird. It was like an interesting concept of rolling the guy and having them guess but then the scoring like didn't really seem right it almost feels like it could be like more wavelength like right like where there's like a scale from 1 to 20 and you have to move the little dial and try and guess where between 1 and 20 and then if you're like close maybe you would get points or something kind of like that right like well well, it is like that you you do guess and you get points for getting close but it's only one person guessing like getting those points kind of but you're not you saw the the discussion aspect just is missing Yeah. yeah so that that's the part that i like so for the game like the fun part of the game was just like the storytelling and it felt kind of like quick rpg storytelling type where you get to tell your story and like okay my character is doing this and this is happening but it seemed disconnected from the point system because the point system was based on if you're guessing their die roll so like you could do terribly and get killed by the dragon but still do really well point wise (laughs) so i felt like the point system was kind of unnecessary the fun part of the game was more like the role playing and making up a story or like a one-shot rpg 
RPG type thing. So that was kind of weird. I didn't really like the wavelength part of the game, <laughs> the point scoring. <laughs> One of my friends hated the game because I guess he didn't like the storytelling or like the point system. And then some of my other friends, they're just like, okay, they would rather play an RPG. But I see like it might be okay for people who kind of want an RPG type experience, but don't have the time to like come up with a story and stuff because it has like these pre-made stories. And if you're just doing like a quick like one shot, then it might be like that. But I still think like the scoring system is kind of weird. But we did make up some cool stories, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, based on the way you're describing it, it almost sounds like it would be kind of more geared towards people who are interested in role playing, but who don't have a lot of experience with it, maybe, mm -hmm. or perhaps maybe like early 20 something role players who are having a night imbibing yeah. and want to do something a little more casual. Like it feels like yeah, that it's, kind it's, of vibe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like a more casual thing. It's like a more structured role playing game that you can just like take out and start playing and just tell the story but there are also like other storytelling games i think for our group like once upon a time like a storytelling game like that or rory story cubes is more like you could just tell the story without worrying about like the xp tracking so i think if i played this one again it would probably be just without the, the scoring of rolling the die and guessing or i would change it so that like everyone has input on the guess and like is guessing together because that's the part i like about guessing someone else's yeah thing. well like, and that's like <laughs> if you're a party too like yeah. in a game like like it feels like that would kind of bring the band together, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Like you see, yeah. you see your companion trip and fall on their face. <laughs> now everyone discusses what they think that person rolled, <laughs> and that is funny, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so that was Adventure Party, the role-playing party game. Lots of party in that game. So much party. <laughs> well, my game has decidedly less party in it. <laughs> the game I'm going to be talking about today is Newsboys, which is is a flip and roll and write. <laughs> like, I feel like this is like basically the universe laughing at me after the last <laughs> game I talked about in this realm where I was just like, you know, they're all whatever. And now this one has cards and dice in it. So it is both wow. a flip and roll and write. Someone come up with, a, like, I think what, Suze's rando writers? Rando is right? the, yeah. that, I like that <laughs> term, but it, I feel like it hasn't caught on. I would like it to catch on because I don't know what else to refer to these games by. But Newsboys, is published by Sashi and Sashi, designed by Sashi, who you all have heard me mention on the podcast before as one of my favorite designers. I really like the games that Sashi comes out with. I knew nothing about this game when I ordered it. I was just like, a game from Sashi? Yes, please click. And I just ordered it, basically sight unseen. So in Newsboys, up to four players are playing as newspaper delivery boys in Brooklyn in the 1890s. And you are trying to balance expanding your paper route with striking for better wages, which was a big deal for paper boys. If anybody's ever seen the movie Newsies or musical <laughs> Newsies also, you might be familiar with the stories. So in Newsboys, you are trying to expand your paper route while also striking to make sure that you get fair wages. And what's neat about this game is turns play simultaneously, so it is very quick gameplay. There is a deck of cards that has symbols both on the back and the front of the cards. So when you flip one card over, you're looking at the back of the deck and also the front of one card, and that will in total show three symbols. And then each player individually has three dice that they can roll on each turn. And when the players roll their dice, they use the symbols on the cards plus their dice to make the pool of six symbols they can choose from. And then they choose one color from the available symbols and they start marking off things on their board. Like a lot of games of this style, you are trying to complete specific sections of the board, specific colors in their entirety. You're trying to up your strike track because every time a payday happens, which happens when people unlock certain bonuses on their sheet. You get paid based on how much money you've collected delivering papers and how high your strike track is. You are going to take the lower of those two numbers on payday and that's what how many points you're going to get paid.
made. So it's interesting. You can't just focus on one or the other. You really have to try and do both. This is a really simple rando writer, really. There is not a lot of depth here. This is a like definitely a family friendly game. You could teach this to kids relatively easily. The boards are easy to understand. You're just marking X's in hexagons and then marking off little other areas on the board. The game plays very quickly. I will admit I was hoping for a little bit more depth here, but I mean, not every game has to be, you know, a giant cauldron of soup. Sometimes it can just be a little ladle of soup. And I think that's what Newsboys is. It is, it is a delightful little ladle of soup in the <laughs> roll and write world. It's gonna, it's not gonna hit the top of my roll and write list as a favorite, but I like the theme. The gameplay is quick. I think this is a great little one to break out kind of as like a, a time killer or a filler between other games or something light to end a game night with. The artwork, as always, is in that classic, Sashi style that, you know, I think a lot of people know and love. And so, yeah, I enjoyed it. I think I was hoping for a little bit more, but it was still fun to play. That's Newsboys from Sashi and Sashi. Do you have like every Sashi and Sashi game? I do not, actually. Oh. I'm missing... I don't have In Front of the Elevators. In Front of the Elevator, I think, is one I've played. Yeah, I, that's like I one of the like of older them. ones. It's like one of the classic Sashi games, I feel. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have that one. I don't have Wind the Film. I think there's at least one other yeah, that I, I don't it. have. I own a lot of Sashi <laughs> and Sashi's titles, and I do tend to really like them most of the time, so mm. that's why I tend to just buy them because I have yeah. never played one of his games and disliked it. All mm. of them have been at worst like, oh, that was fun. Like that's the worst <laughs> they get for me. Yeah. I know from messages he like used to send to Eric Summerer when Eric and I would talk about his games on mm. a previous show we used to do together. Sashi seems like the nicest human. I've never spoken to him personally, but like he was always so kind. He would send Eric messages saying like, thank you so much for talking about my game. And like, you know, like he seems like a good human and I like supporting nice people. So <laughs> that helps too. <laughs> For our thematic discussion this week, we are going to talk about the idea of handicapping in board games specifically. It's a term that is, at least as far as gaming is concerned, is more well known in games like golf or horse racing. For what it's worth, in case anybody was curious where the term came from, this is like a it, middle of the episode tiny <laughs> etymology. <laughs> just teeny. Just okay. a tiny one. It actually comes from the medieval game Hand in Cap, where oh. two players are trading possessions and a third neutral person is judging the difference of value between those possessions. So that's where the term actually came from, was from a game. Wow. And yeah, and then eventually it was extended to horse racing in the early 20th century. That term also came to be known as describing a disability, although generally today most people do not prefer to use that term as far as people with disabilities are concerned. So just to be clear, we are using it in the gaming sense only. But I think there's a couple different ways we can talk about this, right? There are games that kind of have built in handicaps, so to speak, where the setup is different based on player position, like in mm -hmm. player order. Sometimes you will get, get extra resources if you're yeah. like the last player to go, which is kind of a built in handicapping system mm -hmm. of sorts. Or sometimes also so like as the game goes on, like the last person in last place gets like a bonus. I think Power Grid is a famous one of that, which I don't actually remember the rules because I haven't played it in a long time. But I think like the person in last place gets something good. Yeah. And <laughs> I, go I was trying to think know. like, is that considered <laughs> handicapping? And I think it is because the idea of a handicap in a game mm -hmm. is giving either an advantage to a player who is less likely to do well for whatever reason, or giving a disadvantage to a player who is likely to do well. And mm -hmm. those play out in similar fashions, at least in board games, you either get more resources if you're behind, or maybe less if you are ahead, or you mm -hmm. get some kind of a special ability if you're behind, things like that. But they can be baked into the rules of a game itself. And there's also, we can talk about like what you do if you want to incorporate rules like this that are outside of the game's rule set as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and handicaps are actually really common 
in Go in chess, like when you're playing against someone who's very different level. Like in Go, I think you start with extra stones, I think, and then there's like a way to do that. <laughs> so they commonly do that. I haven't played. I think I, we played it like once with someone who's actually like a Go player. And then Toby and I were playing kind of on a team against them. And then so they, they knew how to set up the handicap. And then with chess, I think you could start with fewer pieces or something like same same type of thing in a handicap because people who play those games like they play it really well <laughs> and, and then to people who don't play are just going to get slaughtered <laughs> so then it's what is the point right of a handicap is it mm -hmm. to make the game more fair is it to make it more fun is it to try and give everyone an equal chance of winning because obviously especially for things baked into the rule set it's not taking into account a player's skill level because mm -hmm. the rule book doesn't know who's playing the game yeah. or how familiar they are with the game's mechanics but i would say it's often related to what people like to refer to as game balance Mm -hmm. In that, you know, when game designers are playtesting games, they will sometimes discover that, like, the first player in a given round is more likely to win every game, theoretically. Mm -hmm. And so I think as a result of playtesting, these types of handicaps, advantages, disadvantages mm -hmm. might be introduced later to help balance out those theoretical advantages that people are getting just by player order. Yeah. But in that case, is it actually a handicap or just like, uh, like, right it back out because is it that's the thing i it's it's hard to say right because again is the player in first like they, they are, they going to win the game you you know <laughs> who knows it, it's it's not a given necessarily i would say in general games that give players different levels of resources based on starting order i've never played one of those and felt further on down the road of the game that whatever was given to us was vastly unfair. Like mm -hmm. I've generally taken those and it has ma ended up making sense. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like most game designers are trying to do a good job of making things as fair as possible, but it, it, is, it is hard to account for all possible situations. Yeah, but I think when people, or at least when I think of using handicaps in games, I think of outside of the game rules. So not that type of like game balancing, but when I'm playing with my kids or something, and if I'm playing, like there's this one game that we play that's a speed game. <laughs> and so if I played like for real against my kids, I would just get everything and they would get nothing and then they would not have fun. So then I have to do a handicap to make it fun for them and for me in slightly more fair. So like I go slowly or like I go like slow motion basically in the speed games <laughs> because my kids are four years old. <laughs> and so actually when I it was in high school, I used to play Egyptian rat screw. Oh yeah. Wow. We used to play that back in the day. But yeah, I was like the fastest among my friends at that game. And so then I started playing left-handed. I handicapped myself on purpose because like it's not fun to just always win all the time. So with big skills gaps like that, you want to do like a handicap so that it'll be more fun for you and for the other people because it's probably not fun for them to always lose. And so then I started playing left-handed and then I started getting really good with my left hand too. But then my friends got better too. So then it was more um, competitive. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that last point is an important one, right? I think, and especially when it comes to kids, there have been a lot of discussions about like whether you should let kids win in games or not. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are going to have a lot of varying opinions there. But for me personally, I am not a parent. I have bonus kids who are a little bit older <laughs> and I have nephews who I game with every time I get to see them, but I am not a parent. So take my opinions with a grain <laughs> of salt, but I am of the mindset that generally adults should not enter into a game with the sole intention of letting the kid win. Like that mm -hmm. generally should not be the goal, but I think adults should kind of, to your point, be able to temper their own skills in a way that makes it fun for everyone. And mm -hmm. sometimes that could be the adult winning and sometimes it could be the adult losing. And especially, I think it is important for adults to win games over kids sometimes or for kids to just lose games in general because losing is a hard lesson to learn in life mm -hmm. and gaming is a safe way to learn that 
that lesson. Like, mm-hmm. it is a safe yeah. spot. Nothing bad is going to come from losing a game. But it does feel bad, especially when you're young. And so being able to learn how to lose graciously and how to congratulate the person who won and be willing to pick up that game and play again after having lost it is an important lesson for kiddos. And so that is why I teach my nephews that we play games to have fun. Mm -hmm. Also, it makes winning so much sweeter after you've (laughs) lost. It's so much better. (laughs) So yeah, to your point, if you win all the time, that's boring. That's not fun. I mean, if there's anyone out there that wants to win every time they play any game, that has got to be the most boring (laughs) gaming life. Like, why? Why would you keep playing at that point? There's no mystery. None. Yeah. With my kids, I've played a lot of cooperative games. So like we haven't had to do handicaps because that mostly comes in competitive games. But I mentioned like those speed games. I handicap myself. I played tic-tac-toe with them and I, with that one, I don't purposely lose because I've seen other people playing tic-tac-toe with them and then they like just do badly and they lose like really quick. But when I play, I block them, but I don't like, unless they just completely miss me having two in a row, then I'll win. But like, I don't try to be the tricky (laughs) like you know getting the the yeah double ways I I will block them and like if I get two in a row and then they don't block me then I'll take the three and win so kind of a handicap in that I'm being like a bad computer player like an easy computer player type in (laughs) tic-tac-toe or something like that but yeah I don't I don't want to lose I do need to teach them that losing is is okay and because yeah they started within the past year I think they started realizing like what winning and losing is and getting a little sad when they lose and then even with the speed ones sometimes I'll go a little fast because if they're getting a little bit too uh, confident in there, being like, oh, ha, I'm better or something. <laughs> like That's when mama puts the yeah. smack down on them. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll still make it competitive. <laughs> yep. So we're talking a lot about kids, but mm-hmm. I will admit, like, I have also used some of this kind of mindset when I'm playing games with adults as well. Especially if I am teaching, and we've discussed this a little bit on the podcast before in our Mm -hmm. discussions about how to be a gracious winner or a respectful loser. But like if I'm teaching a game that I know really well, like inside and out, I'm really good at it. And I'm teaching it to a group of players who have all never played it before. I won't necessarily make bad decisions, but I will sometimes make more creative or different or unknown decisions than I typically would. Mm -hmm. And I also, So if the other players would like me to, I will share strategic advice with them. Mm -hmm. And I do that with my nephews too. I'll suggest things and just like, and I always say that like generally you should ask people if they want this because some people really don't want strategic help in a game. But I will ask people, I'm like, you know, do you want me to maybe like mention a few of what your options are right now? Especially if a player is struggling with what to do next and I know the game well, I can say, well, here are a few of the things you could do right now. You know, you could do that. You could do this, you could do that. And I think that is kind of me handicapping myself in a way or giving them a slight advantage over what they would have had, but it's not necessarily an advantage over me, right? It's Mm -hmm. just kind of helping bring them closer up to the level I was already at. And for me, that makes the experience better for everyone. Because again, nobody wants to get trounced and I don't want to trounce anyone. Like that's just not fun for me. (laughs) I think I naturally do that with a lot of games. I just like trying new things each time I play. Oh yeah, because if you did the exact same thing every time, again, less fun, right? (laughs) Yeah. So like, I like trying different things, except for, I guess, in Dungeon Pets, I always try to get cute pets. (laughs) I mean, that, oh, that is a strategy that is hands down always the best in any (laughs) game with cute stuff. Like, oh yeah. In Dog Park, I would like, if any time a breed pops up of one of my dogs, I'm like, gimme, 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 (laughs) gimme. I want those. (laughs) Even if they strategically, point-wise, are not the best picks, I want them. (laughs) Well, we would love to hear from you all what you incorporate into your game games to disadvantage or advantage some of the players, whether it's stuff baked into the game or stuff you've come up with on your own, hit us up on social media or in the Board Game Blitz Discord. Link to join the Discord is in the show notes if you're not already in. And yeah, come let us know how you handicap your games to make the experience better for you. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, boardgameblitz.com for more content and links. This episode was sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Is your game collection suffering from a Midgard deficiency? Head to greyfoxgames.com today to pick up Clans of Midgard and Reavers of Midgard at the card game. And don't forget to use the code BGBLITZ24 at checkout for 20% off any non-exclusive items in your cart. Join the Blitz tier community on Discord for game nights, discussions, and more by following the link in the show notes. 
support the show by leaving us a rating and review on your podcast provider. And if you like us a lot and want to support us monetarily and get some cool perks, check out our Kofi at ko-fi.com slash board game lists today. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow. Until next time, play this game, play this game. If you need something to do, say board game, I love you. Bye, everyone. Bye. I got a review copy of Adventure Party, the role-playing game from Smirk and Dagger Games. This is designed by David Smith and Travis Winstead, art by Graffit Studio. But this is a... Did I say the role-playing game or the role-playing you, party You game? did say the role-playing game <laughs> instead it. of the role-playing party game. <laughs> I know. I was like, I was like do, okay. I, do I say something or not? All right. I'm going to start off. <laughs> okay. This is hard to hold hey. this up. <laughs>